This is the story of the tune who had no ending. Now this particular tune lived, as most tunes do, inside a big brain. And this is what he sounded like. He was a happy tune, but there was something not quite right about him, something unfinished. It was like that all through school. He had trouble finishing his homework. He had trouble finishing cleaning his room, eating all of his vegetables. At first, it just seemed like a phase he was going through, a slow movement. But the years went by, and... It was unsettling, to say the least, to his family and to his friends to hear him like this. They were all very simple tunes with major resolutions. Some of them even had perfect final cadences, and they didn't really know what to make of him. But they accepted him how he was, and he was grateful. But he was also discontent. He wanted a resolution. He wanted to get to the end of the phrase and know where he settled. So he went to visit the wise elder refrain, who lived in a small, hidden fold of the brain, deep within the hippocampus. The tune greeted his elder with the appropriate dignity, explained his problem, his lack of conclusion, and begged for help and advice. The elder said, all tunes have their ending, and if you have not come by yours in the course of things, perhaps you should go out and seek it. With all respect, said the tune, who was raised to be very polite, I've been all over this brain. If there were any loose endings lying around, I'd have found them by now. Yes, said the elder, to find your ending, you must go. Out. And so the tune packed what few belongings he possessed, just a few changes of key really, said goodbye to his loved ones, and made his way to the unfamiliar territory of the vocal tract. He was a bit fearful. There were rumors of other tunes having left the brain, but none had ever come back to tell about it. He was also uncharacteristically resolute. He would find his ending, even if he had to leave behind everything and everyone he knew to do it. He took a deep breath, tripped off the tongue, and found himself flying through the air outside. He circled the head a few times, amazed at how lumpy it was on the outside. He recognized the mouth he had just come from, and the eyes, and, oh, so that's what the ear looked like from the outside. He gazed longingly at its dark opening. It would be so easy just to slip back inside. But before he could lose his nerve, a gust of wind blew up and whirled him away. He fought against it, but it began to come stronger and pull him apart, and in a panic he spied a different ear and dove for the safety of its canal. He sat inside the opening, letting his tempo slow down from an allegro prestissimo to more andante moderato. And as he recovered, his fear began to be replaced by excitement and curiosity. He was inside a different head. He crept up the passageway and found himself in a brain that was at once very familiar and completely alien. Well, there was the amygdala and the hypothalamus right where they should be, but such different shapes and sizes than the ones he was used to. He wandered through the brain, marveling, and up at the frontal lobes he heard a noise and crept closer to investigate. It was a bunch of complex, rich, lush chords, like A minor 11th strange diminished chords, dissonances, and lovely, lush resolutions. He was entranced. One of the chords saw him standing there gaping and said, hey man, come on over, join the party. So the wee tune stepped forward shyly, feeling very thin and insubstantial next to these lush chords and feeling very embarrassed by his lack of ending. But when they heard him through, nobody even blinked at his imperfect resolution. They didn't see it as a problem. Seems to me, said the A minor 11th, you gotta embrace your non-resolution. You just gotta find the right harmony to back it up. And the other chords murmured their agreement. So he said, well, okay, well, could you help me? And this is the harmony they came up with. <laughs> The wee 
Tomb was delighted by his new image, especially at how his non-resolution seemed purposeful and deep. But after a while, he realized it wasn't really him. All those borrowed chords didn't suit his simple character, and he still itched for a resolution. So, reluctantly, he said goodbye to his friends and went out again into the wide world. He traveled from brain to brain, meeting lots of different types of music and learning lots of different things. For instance, he met a waltz. He learned about 3-4 time and how to dance with a lilt, but he didn't find an ending. So he went further and further still, and he met an exotic piece of music in a harmonic minor key. <laughs> was a sharpened seventh to sound mysterious, but I didn't find an ending. So he went on further and further, and he finally met a melody that was everything he wished he could be. It was a simple melody with a graceful harmony and a sweet, certain conclusion. after meeting this piece of music that he lost his cheery optimism because it was so simple and yet so complete and he began to fear he would never be that way. Dejected, he wandered out to the outskirts of that brain out towards the cerebellum so he could be alone and think. And as he neared the inferior colliculus, he began to hear some sniffling sobs. And when he rounded the corner of the medulla oblongata, there was a lovely melody sitting by herself and weeping desperately. She looked up when she heard him approach and tried to pull herself together. She put on a cheerful, vivace expression and introduced herself. struck by her length, her range, and particularly by the firmness of her resolution. He couldn't make a sound. What? she asked defensively. Is it my extra four notes? Oh, those horrible notes! They're so ugly and meaningless, I wish I could just chop them off! And she began to cry again. No, no, wait, wait, said the tune. I'm you. I think you're beautiful. Melody stopped in mid-sniffle. Beautiful? Well, nobody's ever called me beautiful before. Well, I think you're beautiful exactly as you are. The tune sat down next to the melody, and they ended up talking to the wee hours of the morning. She told it where she came from, every melody was perfectly formed, and that she was teased horribly for that ungainly anacrusis which preceded her wherever she went. It got so bad that she just left them all behind and went out into the world to find other melodies like her. But she hadn't found any others, and she was beginning to give up hope. But you have found one, said the tune, and he showed her his curtailed tail. And he told her where he came from. Everyone accepted you exactly as you were. If we could only find them again, he said, I know that they would love you. But don't worry. If there's one brain like that, there's got to be others. We'll just keep going till we find one, okay? Okay, she said. And the very next morning, they stood together at the tip of the tongue and looked out into the world. He turned to her and gave her a hopeful smile. And because he was a polite and well-raised tune, said, after you. Well, okay, she said, but hold on to me so that we don't get blown apart by the wind. And he took a delicate hold of her lovely resolution, and they flew out into the world just like this.
to brain, to brain, to brain. And they never found what they were looking for. But they did find out more about each other and more that they had in common. They were both in the same key. They both had the same time signature. And they were both from the same musical genre. How can two melodies from two different brains end up being so similar, she asked, as they were sitting looking out through a pair of eyes. But he didn't answer because out of the corner of the eyes, he saw a very familiar looking ear. That's my brain, he shouted, follow me, and he dove for the mouth. The melody was startled for a bit, and then she raced after him and caught up with him at the trachea and grabbed onto his final few notes just as they both whistled out through the lips. Well, the day was very windy, and they saw the tune's home brain was way ahead of them and receding rapidly. Hang on tight, he cried, and he began to surf the airwaves. When the wind was coming from behind, he filled himself out with major seventh chords like he'd learned from his jazz friends, and those full chords caught the wind and sped them forward. When the wind was coming toward them, he made himself lithe and sinuous like a melody by Bach, and he was able to slip in between the gusts. It's working, he cried. We're making headway. And with a final accelerando burst of speed, they swerved around the outer fold of the ear, dove into the canal, slid up the passageway, and skidded to a halt right in the middle of the brain, the melody still clutching tightly to the back of the tune. <sighs> Looked up to see the entire population of the brain staring down at them. And when they arose, this is what everybody heard. The tune looked at the melody, and the melody looked back at him. And he looked up at everyone who was assembled there and said, everyone, I'd like you to meet my other half. And there were cheers and hugs all around, celebrating the tunes, homecoming, and welcoming in the melody with the warm embrace of family. And the melody came to adore her extra notes because they linked her to her beloved. And the tune was just as happy as a tune could be. He was home, he was in love, and not only had he found his ending, they had both found a new beginning. Mm -hmm.